Okay, so welcome to the, this uh, new edition of the Physics Colloquia. Uh, we will have uh, during this semester about eight speakers, and the first one uh, is we have pressure to have as first speaker Thomas Chisa. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, uh, he, is, uh, he has been working with uh, optics essentially, experimental and, and also simulation for the last uh, 10 years about. So he, uh, he graduated, so he got his PhD. He's originally from Czech Republic, and he got his PhD from there in uh, the group of uh, Pavel Zemanek, who is uh, a very important person in the field, and uh, in particular, he's a very one of the directors. Is it director position or professor? He refused to be the director. He refused to be the director of the Institute of Aesthetic Instruments in Vernon. Uh, and after his PhD, he moved to, to St. Andrews in the group of Fish and Olympia. Now, most of you are not from optical tweezers, which is a subfield of optics, but Fish and Olympia is one of the, if not the main single uh, scientist in optical tweezers, still actively working in the field. So he moved in that group where he was postdoc for several years. He did a very successful postdoc, as you will see, I suppose that uh, he has several nature publications, I suppose you will speak about that, so you know what those details, and he just got a permanent, uh, permanent position so that he can create his own group. Essentially, he was in St. Andrews, now he's moving to the other side of a river to Dundee, which is like, uh, what, miles. five miles? Okay, so it's walking distance from where he was before. So let's welcome uh, Thomas Chisman. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I didn't know I'm the first one. It's a big uh, pleasure. So, um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, as was said, I graduated in, in Brno. Brno is in Czech Republic. It's not the biggest city, which is Prague. It's uh, the second biggest city. But a uh, couple of uh, interesting facts. Probably uh, you might know the name of uh, Johan Gregor Wendel, who actually is the father of genetics. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Uh, and then if, if, you, if you visit Bernal, you sh actually can see Mendel's original garden when he actually drove all these and came up with the first tools. Bernal is a place of uh, racing, if you, if you are into racing, especially mice racing, this is a place to be. There are very nice festivals with fireworks and nice exhibition center. And uh, this is the Institute of Scientific Instruments, is where I uh, did my PhD. Actually, recently, uh, there was opening of new labs, very new labs called RDC, and very, very soon, they uh, will be meeting manpower, iron people, so uh, might be worth checking if you are looking for uh, some new career prospect. So, um, after finishing my PhD, I stayed for one more year as a postdoc, then I moved to St. Andrews. St. Andrews is uh, a little bit north of Edinburgh. It's a very small place of about, um, I would say, together 20,000 people, which half of them are students of the university. Um, it's famous, famous for quite a few things. There is the oldest golf course in the world, I and mean, if there is a dispute in any tournament, they have to call this uh, particular building here, as well here, to resolve this dispute. This is the home of golf. And, uh, these two guys uh, actually met there. They both studied there. His Royal Highness and uh, his young wife. <coughs> and as I mentioned golf, so just uh, to show you where we are. So this is Tiger Woods shooting on a um, whole number. Um, it's trying to get out of huh? Be good. Oh, it is good. What a shot from Tiger Woods. Come on then, come on. They couldn't be. So, where it was, if you look at the plot, this is Senator from the plane. Here is the 18th hole. This is where Tiger was shooting on this green. This here is physics. So, it's really just two minutes walking from there. And students in San Andrews play for free. So, it's a good place to be. Now, this was taken about uh, when I came in 2007. This is how it looks now, right now, right? You can see the difference, right? 
before, after. Right? So there is, a, there is a new building. This is a new school of medicine. When I got uh, my first fellowship in 2010, I was uh, having a nice window somewhere in here and uh, a very nice modern lab. And uh, I did quite a few things there. But recently I moved to Dundee. Dundee is a uh, rather larger place, uh, but it's very close to St. Andrews. It's practically like a diet walk. And Dundee is very strong in life sciences. Life sciences are practically dominating. It's, uh, and we had uh, James Bright, who won a Nobel Prize there. Also, engineering was very strong in the past. Uh, the uh, radar was invented in Dundee. So were uh, thin film transistors invented. Not probably, not patented, unfortunately, no income for them. So, uh, what I've been doing throughout the career is uh, in the middle of uh, activities on optical manipulation, beam shaping, even microscopy. And uh, I hope I'll convince you that this assembly might be useful in, in uh, many areas. So, when it comes to biomedical photonics or photonics in general, I like to see this as using light and engineering light and its fundamental principles like transfer of momentum and transfer of energy to actually interact, measure in a controlled way. So when it comes to transfer of momentum, we can actually make optical forces on object, which is a foundation of what we know as optical manipulation. So you can see from this example. Right, so this was my first goal for playing in seven years. But obviously it's, it's, uh, it's nice fun, we can, we can grab objects, move them around in microscope stage. But it's very useful for many things, particularly molecular biology. We can use it to investigate things that are happening on a level of uh, genetic material. Also we have transfer of energy that we can utilize in quite simple way, we can take a laser beam and just shoot up some cells, as you can see here, we shoot cells, and unfortunately they are heavily, heavily overdosed, that's why you see the bubble and all these cells are going to die. But if you do it carefully, you can just tell a small opening in the cell membrane and access some molecules from the outer medium to get inside, they would be otherwise impermeable through the cell membrane. And this is the way how you can transfect cells, you can, you can for example, make them fluorescent or actually introduce any other fluorescent proteins or DNA basics and this is the way how we can considerably modify the cell function which can be very useful. Uh, this is an example where we still struggle with a good explanation. This is actually neuronal growth. So this is a neuronal cone and for some reason, which is not really clear, it follows the light when it grows. So you can imagine that it can be pretty useful. Can be uh, you can engineer this to interconnect in the neurons. We don't know where this is caused by optical forces, where there are some chemical changes inside or thermal effects, but um, it's pretty cool. Now, the other big part of photonics, obviously, is imaging. And not only looking at stuff, but actually trying to find out as much as possible about the matter. So, for example, we can combine imaging with spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy is a very powerful, powerful tool. And, uh, it's very massive. So we can actually really map out the chemical composition of a cell. And these days, we are not limited by diffraction limit. There are techniques that allow to go beyond that. We can go pretty much uh, to do, we can do imaging with unprecedented resolution using techniques like state or, or storm. So this is all very exciting. And uh, uh, when my story starts is in optical manipulation, and when I joined the group of uh, Bios and I in Czech Republic, my task was to try to employ non-traditional beam for optical manipulation. The first case was using a vessel beam. Some of you maybe heard about vessel beam. They belong to a group of so-called of so non-diffracting beams. They don't change their profile as they propagate. They have a profile of a nice central core is surrounded by a couple of rings. And uh, one of the very useful features is if you block the beam somewhere, it's not destroyed totally like a Gaussian beam would, right? So if I take a laser pointer and put it on my finger, you don't see anything propagating beyond. But in, in this case, the beam would heal very quickly and recover its initial properties. And the easiest way to do it is to use axicon, which is uh, 
something like a lens, but instead of uh, instead of spherical surface here, you would have a conical, so it's like a, uh, like a little cone. It refracts all the rays kind of under the same axis, uh, under the same angle, you want the big axis. And uh, my task was actually use interference structures of these beams to look at the equations. So the idea is basically if you take two of these beams, you know, if you take two of any beams, Gaussian beams, and send them against each other, they will create a new structure that you know as standing wave. This is the structure of intensity maxima and minima. But it spreads, as a Gaussian beam spreads, they will only give you a couple of optical traps here that you can use for manipulation. While the vessel beams, you can stretch as long as you want. Right? So with this, we could actually generate a huge number of optical traps. And uh, because we can change the phase of the, uh, of the beams, as we hopefully show here, by introducing a pass difference in this optical path. So we can move the whole structure together with the confined objects. And this is how it works in the real sample. And what you see is some objects are actually following this very well, while some objects are not. Now, why is that? Uh, this is related to what we know as side effects. So what is a side effect? Um, I can explain it Oops, in this cartoon. So uh, if our um, if our oops, particle is very small, we can see that it always stays in one of the maxima of uh, this intensity structure. But as it grows, actually two traps will start fighting among the particle, and it will end up with the center in the intensity minimum. Right? And then if the particle grows again, now three traps are involved, one, two, three. And the story repeats periodically. And every time the particle is about to jump from this intensity maximum to an intensity minimum, the stiffness of the trap, the forces in the direction, the propagation of the beams, are equal to zero. So such particles are totally insensitive to the presence of the standing wave. And uh, this actually leads to a concept of optical sorting, optical fractionation. So you can imagine that I will take this structure and tilt it a little bit, like a washboard. And what happens is that the sensitive particles, you know, I can move upstream in the standing wave while the insensitive particles will fall down. And this is the way how I can nicely separate them. There should be an idea. Yeah, so you can see these are the insensitive particles. They just fall down the hill while some sensitive particles could be separated the other way. And if it's done properly, the sensitivity is very high. You can separate objects that differ in size just by something like 60 nanometers. So for colloidal assemblies or for cells, that might be very useful. Right, so uh, when I came to St. Andrews, I continued on this, and uh, I was for the first time introduced to the technology of spatial light correlators. The first task I got was to use this to actually create an alternative to holographic optical tweezers for cell transfection. And uh, as it turns out, the vessel beam that I mentioned might be particularly beneficial for this case. So if you have a standard Gaussian beam, a refraction limited spot, and you want to use it for optical transfection of cells, you need to very precisely position the base of the beam of the cell membrane. Because if you are below or above, the transfection just won't happen. But if you have a axicon generated beam, a vessel beam, a needle of light. You don't need to care. You just point and shoot, and you can be always confident that the uh, transfection will occur. So uh, the task was basically to program these uh, holographic devices to uh, generate such a thing. So uh, what are spatial light modulators? You may heard of them. They are actually uh, liquid crystal micro displays pretty much like you got in your screen. But they are very small, they are half an inch in, in size usually. They have resolution up to uh, full HD these days. But they typically don't modulate the intensity, the, um, the transparency of the layers, but they actually shift the phase. So, um, so actually you can use them to control the beam and split it in, in uh, many beams. 
that, that, that they can create a landscape of optical traps in your system if you wish. So all this is generated with one single space light moderator and it's controlled by a computer interface. Right? <coughs> to game over. So in, in this case, we would like to do something like that with the Besselius. And I built such a device, it's uh, actually quite straightforward because the spatial spectrum of the vessel or the far field is actually just an unknown ring. So um, it's quite possible to, to make a point and click device where you just you know, point at the cells that you want to transect. Um, give it the same view the, uh, in the cells. So these are Chinese hamster overlay cells being sucked in the system. Right, so uh, the interface worked quite well. But on that, I actually found that uh, there is a, quite a big problem with, with the studies, particularly those that are generated by Axicon. So whenever you try to generate a nice vessel with an Axicon, you face two problems. First of all, the Axicons are never perfect. So because they are conical, the tip, it can't be made really sharp. It's always kind of a blade. So you can imagine that from your tip propagates sort of static away, and it interferes with your remaining vessel beam, creating kind of axial oscillation. So if you really want to have something that is nice and flat and uniform and propagates along very large distance, this is not a good solution. So I was looking for a way how to create a vessel beam that would really propagate uniformly over a certain extent and then just fade. And uh, this is the theoretical prediction. This is the experiment that I made. But to get from here to here, it took me pretty much one year. And the reason for that was that uh, this field is extremely sensitive to optical aberrations, which is what I'm going to be talking mostly today about. <clears throat> so what are optical aberrations? If you look around, you'll see a lot of people in glasses. This is because they need correction for the aberration. Optical aberrations are present in any optical component that you uh, that you can buy. So they are already in lasers, in microscope systems, in any kind of optomechanics detectors, you name it. So um, just to kind of uh, get a clear picture, this was my daughter uh, three, four years ago when I was when I started work on the aberrations. She was identified by this a very a diagnosed with very strong. Uh, astigmatism, very strong aberration. So to explain a kid what an aberration is, uh, fortunately there is Peppa Pig, right? <coughs> Daddy Pig wears glasses. He needs to wear glasses to see clearly. When Daddy Pig wears his glasses, everything looks fine. But when Daddy Pig takes his glasses off, he can't see things clearly. Everything looks a bit soft and fuzzy. So it is very important that Daddy Pig knows where his glasses are. Right. So now nobody has an excuse that doesn't, he doesn't understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, so, what is optical what are aberrations in more scientific language, right? If you use your eye, what it does, it converts an ideal plane wave to an ideal spherical wave, and it, it ends up on a retina in perfect diffraction and form. Or it would be the case if your eyes is a perfect eye, but it's never the case. And the deviations from this ideal performance actually leads to spreading of this point, the point spread function, and the worse the spreading is, the, the, the worse is your ability to read. But all these kind of aberrations are on the side of the instrument, on the kind of uh, on, on the side of the instrument we use to observe the objects. But in many cases, even with a perfect eye or perfectly corrected eye, you might not be able to see what uh, you, you wish to see. For example, here you would like to see who's on the other side, but you can't because the aberration is on the side of the object. And this is what we in biology usually call sample-induced aberrations. 
By that, an equivalent of this in astronomy, where the technique of adaptive optics was pioneered. So, uh, if you look at stars from ground, they twinkle, they change colors, and they you know, move around a little bit, which is wonderful, romantic, right? But for astronomers who are not dating, it's a real nightmare. Right? So, um, similarly, in, in biology and medicine, we've got tissues, samples, that we can't see really through because they are very turbid, very random. And we can only see with the very sophisticated techniques up to, say, a couple hundred micrometers. Right? Afterwards, the information is usually lost. So we got first solution, and kind of easy solution, is to get rid of the turbulence. We can take our instrument, load it to a space shuttle, and deliver it to the orbit. And there is no atmosphere, so nothing is disturbing. The, uh, the imaging, or in, in, in microscopy or medicine, we can do section histology. You can just chop off the obstructing tissue. But the price for that might be uh, too large, obviously, right? So the astronomers came up with the idea of um, adaptive optics. And this is a um, kind of night shift on a ground-based telescope. And what's happening here is uh, they actually shine these uh, this powerful lasers in, in the sky that create artificial guide stars. And they use them as reference to correct for atmospheric turbulence using adaptive optics. And when they do that, when they do that, um, their stars, the twinkling stars, after they turn on this, this adaptive correction, can actually reveal much more. The, as you can see here, it's not, it's not one star, but these are two stars. So you can see that the resolution was vastly improved by this technique. And uh, the question is whether something like that is possible in, in biology and medicine. And what of that was done? But actually, coming back to my problem of optical aberrations in generations of the best cell beam, actually turned out to be a very good solution. And uh, uh, it kind of started to define the rest of my career. So again, to explain what I did with them, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use spatial light moderators that I already talked about, but I'm going to use them a little bit different way. And uh, the way I'm using that is uh, sort of a remarkable similarity to uh, this, this kind of semaphores that I used in, in this novel by Terry Pratchett, Colin Postal. If you like uh, Terry Pratchett's novel, I can recommend this very much. So what happened there, the citizens of this world, we're using these huge uh, semaphores uh, to communicate. These are basically displays, binary displays of, of segments that could be independently turned on and off. And they use them to encode information, to communicate. So how can you use such a semaphore to deal with aberrations? So this is a very simplified version of that. I'm going to show a little uh, more uh, sophisticated. But here we go. Here is my laser beam that comes through perfect optical system. And all these rays will be uh, refracted in such a way that they will end up in a single point. But obviously, uh, to explain what I need to explain is we, we need to take the concept of waves. And as you can see, all these waves will interfere constructively inside in this single point. Right? They come to the point in phase. So they Interfere constructively, this is the way how they can increase. Actually, it's not to the full screen for some reason. Okay, that's better. But if the system is aberrated, this is not always fulfilled. We don't have only the constructive interference, but we also have uh, destructive interference, the opposite case, when these waves will cancel each other. And this is what costs us the energy in the focal point. This is what is responsible for spreading away of the power from the center. So now we're going to put the, uh, the semaphore somewhere here. And uh, as you can see, all these segments, all these windows that can be opened and closed are close to the beginning. We're only going to use one somewhere in the middle, say, for our phase reference. Right? So let's open one. And now what we need to do is to place an intensity detector into the point where we want the light to be optimally focused, which is here. Now what we can do here is we can then sequentially open each of these windows in, 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 in steps. And uh, whenever we see constructive interference, we will take a higher signal for this particular mode. 
But whenever we detect lower interference, we know, uh, lower signal, we know that this is destructive interference. This is what we want to eliminate. And all we need to do is to scan the system this way one by one. And by this, we will be able to separate, say, the good guys from the bad guys. So this is another good one, a bad one, right? another bad one. So once we do this scan, we got a complete knowledge about our interference in the system, and we can turn on simultaneously only those that contribute constructively. And if we do that, as you can see here, we can get much higher power, and all these rays are contributing constructively. But as I said, our specialized modulator is a phase modulator, so we can do more. Right? We can actually compare these, these, these bad guys, these interfering not constructively, and we can phase sheet them in such a way that they will actually contribute constructively as well. And here you can see that we have in a totally operated system, totally random system, we can get the full power into the focal point. And now we burn the detector. Follows through that. Right. <clears throat> so what we really do, how we really use the spatial line modulator. So there are two things. <coughs> First of all, uh, we're gonna use grating. Gratings, as you know, if you send light through grating, it uh, kind of deflects the light in many diffraction orders. Unless you use this, what we call, ideally, blaze grating, right? Blaze grating with these phase steps of 2 pi will only deflect the light, uh, diffract the light into one order. And the periodicity of the grating will dictate how much it will diffract. And uh, when we do that, we can actually use this as sort of closing and opening the window. So how it works. Um, let's see. Okay. <coughs> All right. So here is my beam somewhere in the system has some kind of Gaussian profile and has some phase distribution, some aberrations. But I don't really know about any of that. Right? What I can do, I can send such a beam through my optical system and get a spot. And you can see it's not nice, it's kind of aberrated. So what I'll do, I'll actually first employ grating. So if I do that, you can see that the spot will shift into uh, what we call first diffraction or in the middle, it was zero diffraction. And then I will kind of cut virtually my spatial light modulator into, into this uh, subdomain. And uh, what I do at the beginning, I will only apply the grating on one of the subdomains. So I will see the contribution of the light in here in the place of the first order. Now I can use another one simultaneously with this, and we can see fringes already. So now we got interference. Now I will put somewhere uh, the intensity probe. And if I start changing phase in this beam, just by shifting the grating over the, the domain, I will see periodical sinusoidal signal. And this function immediately tells me what is the maximal phase, what is the optimal phase that I should employ for the testing mode to interfere constructively with the, with the reference. If I do the scan for all these modes in the system, I will get the knowledge about both the amplitude and the phase of the beam, uh, because the Interference term is very simply described just by this equation. So once I do a scan for the whole system, I get, as I said, the amplitude and phase, and both are actually quite important as will be uh, clear in a second. Right. So here's the experimental data. All we need is a very simple system: a laser sending a beam on the spatial light modulator. Uh, then we can focus it on simple lens and use one CCD pixel as an intensity detector. And here is my amplitude and the phase that I used uh, to, to convert this originally rather ugly spot to this very nice diffraction limited spot that you would have a problem to distinguish from the storage. Similarly for the vessel beam. This is the vessel beam that was operating at the beginning and this is how it looks like when I do the correction. <coughs> And here at the bottom, you can see that how I can use it if I want to do some kind of nice beam shaping. So this is the original image that I got without any 
uh, correction, and this is when I employ the phase correction. But when I generate the hologram for this, I need to know what amplitude, what, what uh, intensity I have on my spatial light modulator. And if I use the information, I can actually get even better correction. And this is the difference uh, between the simulation of the actual data. And if we look at the details, we will see that the speckles are practically identical. So this demonstrates that with this technique, I have very high control over the beam. But so far, everything was just about the systematic aberration the operations from the side of the detector. Now I promise that I will show you something on this side where we can correct this. And if you think about it, there is no reason why it shouldn't work because all I need to do is to send modes through my system and get intensity from a single point detector that can be anywhere, including the sample itself, which is the biggest advantage of this approach. Unfortunately for me, I was not the very first one who saw about this, and there is a series of seminar papers by Ivo Galekov and his leader, uh, uh, Moss, who actually showed a similar thing that you can send uh, a wave even through a diffuser, something totally aberrating, and if you appreciate the beam the correct way, you can actually end up with a very, very high intensity in the focus. And uh, also, Eric Betzig. Uh, in 2010, used uh, about the same time as my paper was published, used this technique to correct uh, two photon images of uh, brain tissue. So, just to show you the power, we actually decided to, to try to do it in trapping application, which is what uh, I was uh, developing in San Andrews. So, here you see how it, uh, how it can work. Right. Here is the beam as it comes from the laser. This is what happens if I correct for the systematic aberration. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce very highly scattering tissue phantom. It's uh, basically a, a fixed layer of, of uh, a kind of frozen colloidal mixture. And you can see speckles all around. The beam, when it passes through it, it scatters all around. But I can select the point and intensify the beam in the single point very strongly, regardless of the aberration. Unfortunately, it's very specific to play, so if I move the aberration, you can see it's, it's almost lost. But the ratio of the scattered signal and the intensified signal can be exceeding a couple of hours of magnitude. So it was published in, uh, in uh, Nature Photonics. It was sufficient for optical trapping. And uh, in a little more accessible way, it's uh, described in this um, review paper. Now, recently there have been development on this. <coughs> Excuse me. So, first of all, um, if you are lucky enough and your aberration is very planar, it's maybe a sheet or a thin diffuser, uh, it turns out that you don't really need any probe inside. Right? So, it's, it's, it's uh, kind of related to what is called a memory effect. So, basically, if you take a laser beam, send it on your diffuser and start changing the angle of incidence, what will happen here is the spectral distribution will remain the same, it will just uh, shift its place. So if you do scanning like that across the whole sample, right, you can find out that you have enough information to recover first what was the spectral distribution, what was the object, which can be very useful. So you can actually recover the object even without the knowledge of the spectral pattern. And also, having a solid probe somewhere in the sample, what I use for school as a particle, but can be many other things, having it inside the sample is not always convenient. And uh, therefore, this, uh, these people actually thought where they could use something much less invasive, and they come up with the idea of using ultrasound. And it shows, uh, this, this paper shows that uh, obviously you would expect that uh, if you use the ultrasound, you can get the resolution of the ultrasonic signal. But you can go beyond it. This is all based on uh, acoustic effects. So basically, if you send an acoustic signal into, say, a tissue or a fluid medium, and then you send an optical wave in it, it will be frequency shifted for both the frequency of uh, the ultrasonic signal. And this is what you can separate from the remaining one. But you could expect that it will be only uh, reaching the resolution of the acoustic signal. But using the tricks 
similar to step microscopy, they manage to squeeze it up to the optical line. So yeah, if you are if you are lucky enough and you can use all these techniques, you can do really imaging inside of the media, uh, having this, this ultrasonic signal as your assisting calibration device. But my strategy was uh, a little bit different. I tried to use optical fibers as, as endoscopes. So obviously you all are familiar with the concept of endoscopes. You are probably well know that uh, they are based on, um, on optical fibers. And how optical fibers work, they, are, um, they rely on total internal reflection on the wall. So if you couple light into media that, is, uh, that, that has higher refractive index than the surrounding media, it kind of guides the light, confines the light, and it can be only uh, Take it out once, uh, once you exceed the angle of total internal reflection. And basically, these uh, standard endoscopes are just parallel, coherent uh, fiber bundles. Basically, they can transfer information from one end to another end. But they are still quite chunky. So, if you look at them, uh, this is the state of the art uh, fiber. Um, what is important, you need to keep a spacing between the channels because the photons would like to tunnel between these, these cores and randomize the signal. So you have to keep them apart. Right? What you could do, you could uh, shrink this, uh, this waveguide to uh, single mode optical waveguide. But then the transmission efficiency of this fiber would be very low, so people don't usually do that. But if you could deal somehow with randomization, if you could deal with photons jumping from one core to another, you would maybe not need to have any cores at all. You could, you could merge all of them into one central bun. Right? That would be actually what you know as multimode optical fiber. <coughs> so let's have a look. Can a multimode optical fiber work as endoscope? Possibly, right? And uh, these days we have sort of um, uh, sort of monolithes and technology that uh, is usually based on these gradient index lenses. Basically, you can drill a hole into my mouse skull. But this, this uh, equivalence of fibers, they are in diameters in the order of, of one millimeter, which is not really big help. So how about a standard mounting of fiber that you can buy from Torlabs? Right, so what happens if you send a light into one end, coherent light into one end of the fiber? What you get on the other side is this, this speckled pattern. But as I showed, we could deal with such speckled patterns. If we apply this waveform correction, we could probably be able to convert this to this. And in this sense, if we can do that, we could actually use multimode fibers just as objectives, with having the advantage that they are so narrow. They are uh, typically in the order of uh, tens to hundreds of micrometers, which is much smaller than the uh, endoscopes that are being used today. And in this case, we could actually probably transfer or send the fibers into tissue through the narrowest of optical, uh, surgical images. So this is what I actually done already in 2009. This is a multi-mode fiber, and I show that I can actually make a point at the output of the fiber much stronger than the surrounding uh, speckled pattern. But it's, as you can see, there is still a lot of noise. One of the reasons why there is a lot of noise is that uh, you need to do quite a few things to, to eliminate it to allow a good performance. So what needs to be done is to take care about all the aspects how I was randomized, including not only phase but also polarization and the amplitude. So how do we do that? This is the standard way. This is my spatial light moderator. This is my reference. This is the testing mode. Uh, I'll send the resulting interfering structure into the multi mode fiber and look at the other end. When I see a point, I can measure the intensity in there. And when I change the phase of the testing mode, again, I can see the same sort of signal and find out what is the best phase to improve constructively my effects. And if I do it for all of these points at the end, I can actually build up a transformation matrix between these input modes, these, these squares to my spatial line modulator, and the output points at the, at the fiber. So how I need to modify it to allow the polarization? The way I had done it was basically using two different gratings for my two modes. And then I coupled the light in this Fourier plane 
from two different zones into the same fiber, but one with polarization rotating. So it was one of the things. The other problem is if I send only the internal reference mode into the fiber, I will still get a speck of water. Whenever I have random interfering structures, there are places where the intensity is equal to zero. In such places, I can't use as a reference because there is basically no signal that will give me, uh, that, 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 will, that will provide the reference. So uh, instead of that, uh, I use a single mode fiber, and uh, this gives me a nice and smooth overlapping, uh, overlapping signal that uh, doesn't have this problem. And when I done that, um, I'm gonna skip this. I could actually completely or almost completely eliminate the, um, the, the noise as you can see here. So this is the result. And I can easily combine as many points as I want at the end of the fiber and I can also create any landscape this, uh, that I want. And obviously because I was doing a lot of optical trapping, I kind of wanted to show the power of that on this example. So um, you can see um, optical trapped objects from the light coming from multiple into the fiber. It's quite a nice thing. The white light also comes through the fiber. I had, I had to use some kind of uh, white light signal as an indication. Right. So this was all about pushing the light, you know, pushing the light through the fiber in a way that it will, it will result in something I want. But imaging is somewhere more difficult, somewhere more complex. Because we have some random signal, we don't know what it is, but we need to recover what it is from the other end. Now, how, how this works? So, let's look here in the middle. This is my sample. And I'm going to look at the sample from two different sides. Right? On this side, as you can see, I got a standard microscope. This is a microscope objective and a tube lens. So, microscope objective, what it does to the light, it, it does Fourier transform. Right? And then I have a tube lens that does also Fourier transform, which efficiently in, inverts the first one. And I get a copy of the field of the sample on the CC. So this is how I do the image. Now on the other side, I have a multimode fiber. Multimode fiber also does some kind of transformation. It's uh, some bizarre random stuff, but I can invert it. And that's why there is all the optics, including the SLM. And it's all designed in such a way that here on this CC I will get the, um, the uh, unscrambled image from the sample. Right, so how it works, um, we can show on, say, this example of uh, particles. So now we are looking at fluor and not fluor, and uh, polystyrene particles in the system. This is with a standard microscope on the left side, this is uh, through the multimode fiber. You can see it's pixelated, so uh, it's not absolutely ideal, but as a demonstration that it can be a uh, valid concept, it's uh, probably sufficient. The good thing is that we can keep some modalities of microscopy using that. For example, dark field. All I need to do is to introduce a dark field filter before I couple the uh, laser light into the fiber, and uh, I can convert nicely the uh, images to dark field, which allows me to see much uh, smaller objects that I would be able to see in a very bright field. Right, now, whenever it comes to bio-applications, the, the bio people always want fluorescent, obviously, right, because it's much more powerful. So, um, I also converted the system to provide for some imaging. In this case, what we are doing is we are scanning very quickly a number of points, one by one, at the end of the multiple fiber. Now the problem is with specialized modulators, specialized modulators, I could never reach the speed. So there is a trick, there is a combination of spatial light modulator and acoustic reflector. And the encoding, the hologram that I sent on the spatial light modulator is designed in such a way that for every single angle from every different angle that I illuminate the spatial light monitor, it gives me a different spot. So basically I have a static hologram here, and for different angles coming from the A or D, I get different points here, and this is how the scanning is achieved. Again, it's going to be a comparison. So this is again the direct preview with the standard microscope. You can see actually the scanning of the points, but you can't see the scanning so fast that you can't see it. 
But this is what I actually get um, through the optical fibers. Uh, sorry, what I failed to say is obviously the, um, the, the light signal here creates this, this spots. But what I'm looking at is a fluorescent response that I collect backwards uh, from, from the fiber and detect on the photomagnetic line tube. Right. So here we are looking at the fluorescence. But because we know where the point is and every single time we can properly associate the, the response to the position, this is how we can build the image, basically the very same way as you do it in any other scanning technique. <coughs> But the resolution is very low, as you can see. But we can do, we can do tricks. We can actually um, introduce more holograms. We can interlace between the points, as you will see in a second. So now I'm actually kind of shifting four sets of these, these points, and I can increase the resolution on the account of the speed, obviously, as much as I want. Now there is a couple of uh, interesting aspects, right? So first of all, on this kind of endoscopes, I don't have any lens, right? so no lens is, is needed. I just need a bare straight fiber. But what I didn't tell you is where is the imaging done? And uh, basically, the answer is we have freedom to choose. We can choose either in here, where we will have very small field of view, but very high resolution, and very high numerical aperture. Or we can go somewhere further, which will give us much larger field of view, much smaller resolution. The information, uh, the, the, the amount of information that I can get with one scan is always the same. Right? So here is an example of how we could actually nicely scan the same object with three different modifications. And the advantage is I don't need to do anything else but to put the fiber closer to the object and change the over. So I do everything pretty much external. No need to adjust any optics at the end of the fiber, which is a bigger than that. Right, um, that was published in, in, in last year, and uh, uh, it was published during the summer, so we actually also received congratulations from the Scottish Parliament. Uh, it signifies that there was not much going on at the time. Um, one important aspect also is that uh, not everything in the fiber is randomized without any rules. So <clears throat> one of the nice things is the conservation of propagation constants. What I mean, if you couple the light into the fiber uh, under a certain angle with respect to the axis, the photons basically bounce there with the same angle and then you leave with the same angle. Right? So any light that is on this kind of annular zone in the far field will end up in the same annular zone when it leaves the fiber. So, in a sense, if you think about it, for any asymmetrically independent modulations, this system will work as a Fourier system. Because everything, every, every axial component of uh, the, the K vectors will be conserved. <clears throat> so, for example, if I take my modulation, my, my uh, hologram that leads to a single point, and I just add this kind of phase piston to this, I can convert the ideal diffraction limiting score to a bottle beam. Bottle beam is a beam that has um, zero value of intensity at the optical axis, and this is the beam that is used in super resolution techniques. So maybe I could use this to actually go super resolution in through the optical fiber. Similarly, if I cut down an annular zone, I can convert my um, diffraction limited beam to a vessel beam that has much larger propagation distance might be very useful in things like light shimmers. And also, if I use a defocus that is also azimuthal independent, I can shift the resulting focus a little bit way or closer to the fiber without a need of recalibration of the system, which is also very useful. Right, one of the criticisms always is the speed. Right? How fast can you generate the holograms? Uh, fortunately, uh, there is uh, GPU technology. Uh, I was a uh, pioneer to in gaming industry, basically, and it speeds up certain, certain uh, programming operations by many orders of magnitude. Right? So if you've got children and they like to play computer games, don't be too harsh to them because they are contributing to science. Right, so this is a uh, um, live demonstration. This is uh, the core of the optical fiber, and uh, 
here we are calculating all these holograms live on the um, on the using the GPU. So the computational capacity is much much larger than you would get on a single computer. Let me show you something maybe more entertaining. <laughs> Projection of James Bond movie. Right. So, um, what is the next step? The next step is actually use it for something useful. So, um, this is uh, Nigel and Rich, who's the dean of Lincoln College in Oxford. He's a neurobiologist. And he's particularly interested in this region of brain uh, called the hippocampus, which is uh, where, which is basically a, a part of the brain that is responsible for formation of memory. And the very interesting processes are happening there, but it's very difficult to observe them. And uh, we hope that this technology could allow to see these this, uh, processes that lead to uh, pre-synoptic connections and other things. So we are actually now developing the system for these particular uses on uh, transeptic mice. Now, a couple of related projects. This is a this is a light this is a concept of light sheet microscope. This is an alternative to confocal scanning. Basically, in cold focal scanning, you take a point and kind of scan your sample and collect the intensity. And then, if you if you change the focal plane, you can get a section from another from the focal plane. And uh, the alternative is to use a light sheet, which is a different kind of section. Basically, you send this kind of sheet of light across your sample, and then you excite the fluorescence only in a certain plane. Then you can scan this this plane nicely through the sample and build up a 3D model of, uh, of the, the object. Now, in St. Andrews, this is an idea of, uh, of uh, my colleague uh, Tom Wettenburg. Basically, most of the people use this, this Gaussian beams and scan them to do the line sheet. But there is a trade-off, right? So the narrower you want to have it, the shorter will be your field of view. So there is a trade-off between resolution and field of view. But we, we actually found, or Tom actually found, that we use different kind of beams in connection, in, in, in connection with the uh, deconvolution algorithm. We can actually recover much more. We can, we can much, make much better trade-off about an order of magnitude better than it was possible with the Gaussian beam. So this, is, uh, this, this beam is called an airy beam. It can be quite easily generated. If you deconvolve, uh, this is a comparison between the Gaussian and the uh, and you can see that the field of view is actually much, much larger than the same resolution. Now, similarly, I was playing with a light sheet uh, coming from my optical fiber. So we can imagine this is uh, a light sheet that comes from the fiber. And changing the hologram, I can actually move it up and down, as you can see here. This is how I can do quite easily the section. So this is a scanning light sheet. And if I put it inside my uh, my sample. And here I only have fluorescent particles, but you can see how they blink. Right? So every time the sheet goes through the particles, they blink. And I can collect all these images and then I can quite nicely recover what's going on in the sample and build up a, a 3D model of them. So I'm still working on it. This was not published yet. And uh, this is another, this is not that right. It's still related to holography. This is a work that I contributed on. Um, on this, uh, this kind of uh, projection system for photovoltaic retinal processes. Basically, uh, there is a lot of blindness in the world, even in the developed world, and the majority of this is because your photoreceptors will die. Right? And uh, what is good, the good news are that you still have the neurons that will take the information and transfer them to your brain. But they are kind of lazy, they are talking to each other, but they are not functioning. But you can stimulate them. You can stimulate them using this kind of photovoltaic prosthesis. These are just uh, basically photodiodes. And if you illuminate them, they will give you the missing action potential. You can, you can basically make them work exactly as the photoreceptors. Unfortunately, they, are, they can't work with the ambient light because it's, it's very weak. So you need to send there a lot of optical power together with your image information. 
And uh, uh, that's where the problem is, because it costs you a lot of energy. And if you want to power this kind of uh, device, it sends you laser light into your eyes, uh, it's very difficult to, to do it with some kind of pocket-held battery. So efficiency is very precious, and the first, the first uh, models of this, of this uh, projection system use just standard LCD, but LCD kills the light. Right? It makes the, uh, the liquid crystals are basically either transparent or not transparent, but if you want to create an image, you have to kill a block of light. Well, but if you use holography, you don't kill any light, you just redistribute the light into the places that you want, and the efficiency can be very high. So uh, we designed there this kind of uh, alternative that is based on holography with spatial light modeling here. And uh, uh, obviously we have to test it first on mice. So this is uh, the spatial light modeling built on this what is called sweet lamp. There are those under there. And uh, the way to test the, the runs is basically they can't tell you, right? Like I see stuff. What do you, what do you have to do? You have to somehow steal information from them, which is done usually using um, visual and potentials. Basically, you send some kind of checkerboard structures to their eyes, or, or, or just stripes, and then you move them. And then you put a couple of electrodes on their heads and collect the signal. And if you see correlation, you know that they see. Right? So uh, here are some, some results. So this is uh, zero is the time when we swapped the holograms, and you can see there is a, some kind of response after 200 uh, uh, milliseconds. So they actually can see what we are showing in their eyes. Right. And the last bit is a recent work on structure. We do not want to go too much into details. Uh, so this is actually a project that took incredible seven years, and it was the last thing I started uh, in the group of files and I. Well, uh, so basically what is, what is a tractor beam? Um, if you ask any scientist who works in this area, he will tell you something a little bit different. So my vision of tractor beam is that it's actually an optical field that is static, right? So we don't play any tricks, like with optical features, we will move the particles towards you. Uh, it moves the object towards the origin of the light, right? And uh, it's basically based purely on the light matter interaction. There is no heating effect involved or any other medium, right? So um, we actually came to this uh, possibility by an accident, but we were not the first one, and we found that it was actually published in the before. So this gentleman, Philip Marston, showed that vessel beams, again, vessel beams, uh, have, this, have this ability. So if you have sufficiently large angles of the vessel beam, uh, you can look at the parameter space between the angle and the size of the object, and you can see there are these, these highlights where this negative force occurs. So basically, if you put object on the axis, it would move backwards, and which was quite a surprise. Later on, Jack and G actually showed exactly the same thing in optical domain, <coughs> and to our surprise, we managed to publish that in Nature Photonics. But it kind of opened the window for us. So, um, our way, our, our idea was actually not do it in the vessel room, because it turns out it's extremely difficult to do it in the vessel room. Instead, we just use two beams to actually, um, to actually simplify the geometry and to make it even more simple. Uh, we use only one beam. We use only one beam that reflected on the surface, so it um, eliminated any alignment issues. And actually, we could see successfully the fractal beam procure. And not only that, but we could see that this geometry is particularly suitable for optical sorting. So uh, <clears throat> some particles, again, are very sensitive to this for some particles are not. So if I put a mixture of particles inside the tractor beam and just turn on the light, you can see the big objects are here and the small objects are here. Right? So it's very efficient. There was uh, live the video that was not sped up. And uh, again, there was quite a lot of, uh, a lot of press releases because of the parallel <coughs> Star Trek and other things. And uh, it was not really uh, very fair towards my Czech colleagues, especially from uh, British media. So uh, I always joke that uh, the British side didn't really invent it any, any, any tractor beam, but uh, there was an alternative beam that looked like this. 
So um, thank you for our attention. So yeah, numerical aperture is, is basically what defines the resolution. Uh, if I do everything right, I can squeeze over 90-95% of light into the single spot at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any other question? At the beginning of your presentation, you show the oxycon and uh, show how you improve the quality of oxycon mm -hmm. uh, with SLM. Right. But uh, could you create the basic beam without oxycon, just with SLM? Yes, that was actually the case. It was probably not that clear, but uh, in this case, there was no oxycon. In this case, there was. Right? So I used the original oxycon. And I used the lens to create a spatial spectrum mm -hmm. here on the spatial light modulation, which is practically an analysis, which gives you an advantage that you only need to modulate the algorithm at all. But the reason I didn't modulate anything else was to basically spatial filter the, the, the uh, SLB, which already leaves you with much better, much better quality of the um, of the SLB because also the disturbing frequencies are located on the optical axis or the optical axis. But this was done totally without any axis. So you have a few options to do it. The very simple option is basically use such hologram, illuminate it uniformly, and then you block all the light that is not modulated somewhere in the pathway, right? which will leave you with very nice, very nice uh, vessel beam. But it will not be straight. It will be, if, it, if it's a sharp aperture, it will be a sync function. This one uh, was designed in such a way that it's, it's really 
So the resolution of your special life of liquor is enough to create very good vessel beam without axiom. Yes. Okay, so let's thank Thomas again. Thank you.